Hey, what's up YouTube? I hope you're doing well. In today's video, something a bit different. I've not been super productive lately in terms of YouTube videos and Patreon projects because I'm taking some time off to get myself up to speed on the latest UE5 features. There are tons of new features I haven't had the chance to experiment with yet. Things like PCG, geometry scripting, scriptable tools and so on. Features that I'm most interested in and features that I will definitely want to showcase in upcoming projects and videos. One feature I also wanted to try was Control Rig, and so I finally gave it a fair shot and spent the last 3 days or so toying with it. And although most of it is relatively straightforward, some of it is also not. Now I want to point out that Epic has done an awesome job documenting Control Rig, and has provided a great educational resource in the form of extra content available for free on the marketplace. So I obviously took a deep look into it and had some difficulties making sense of the most advanced examples, hence why I decided to make a video on the subject. You see, I was interested in building a decent rig for a personal project of mine and was keen to replicate this neat IKFK spine setup. Now, my philosophy is to never copy anything unless I understand it, and so with great struggle, I reconstructed that spine setup from scratch, a simpler one, with a few adjustments, and thought a quick breakdown would interest you guys. And then it kinda spiraled into, hey, while I'm at it, why not make a quick start guide and show some other things as well. So in this video, I'm first going to go over the basics of control rig, then I'll make a breakdown of this IKFK spine, then a breakdown of a switchable IKFK arm, and finally I'll explain how this in-game IK leg setup works. Alright, let's dive right into it. First of all, I used Blender to create a basic armature. The one important thing when working with Blender and Control Rig is to make sure the bone's forward axis is x-axis. The secondary axis is likely to be y or negative y. That's the setup that worked best for me. IKs in Control Rig worked out of the box with the armature exported that way. Now it's likely you can get it to work with bones oriented differently, but I personally had a lot of issues until I used those export settings, so you do you I guess. Next, in UE, first things first, make sure Control Rig is enabled. Having imported my skeletal mesh, I can then create a blank Control Rig and import a hierarchy. Or right click and create one from that skeletal mesh, same but different. In case I update the skeleton, maybe tweak the hierarchy in Blender and re-import it at a later date or something, I can refresh the controls rig hierarchy like so. There's also a way to do that automatically using the construct event, but more on that later on. Having done that, you can now do many things, like create, duplicate and remove bones, create nulls, and nulls are quite important. The way I see it, they are like dummies or empties in your typical 3D software. I think it used to be called something different in earlier versions of Control Rig, I'm not sure, but it seems like everyone has a different name for nulls. For instance, that content example has a bunch of rigs with nulls named buffers, and that kinda stuck with me, so if you hear me mention a buffer, I mean null. Anyway, nulls don't do anything besides having a transform and potentially being parented to something and being the parent of other things. Most often, you'll use nulls to organize your hierarchy, apply transforms to a group of controls and so on. Next, obviously, you can also create controls and move them around, but be aware that this is the current temporary position. To have this position be that controls quote-unquote zero position, you can right-click on it and call set offset transform from current. You can also do that based on the closest bone, or by creating a control directly on a bone like so. I'm not going to go in too deep here, because again it's all pretty straightforward and the documentation does a great job at explaining the basics. Ok, so you can do plenty manually, but you can also do plenty using nodes. This construct event is like a blueprint's construction script. It's fired once upon that control rig being constructed, so you can choose to do expensive computation and not worry too much about performance here. So you can create nulls and controls, update initial transforms, set up parents and so on to procedurally build a rig. That way you don't have to do anything manually, besides building the construction logic, obviously, it's all automated and the control rig can be ported to any skeleton, which is neat. So let's do a quick example. First you can force an update on the skeleton so you don't have to refresh it manually in case the hierarchy changed. So I'm going to delete all bones and call this import skeleton node to import bones from the currently assigned skeleton. Cool. Next, 
I'm going to create a function named create spine and add an input pin. Now it says one variable you're going to work with the most in control rig is the rig element key. Here I'm going to make an array called bones. Then for each I'm going to create a control. It's going to be parented to that bone and its name is going to be that bone's name plus underscore control. Now a control can be many things. It can be made to orient things, so likely to have no effect during translation, or the other way around, or it can support all transforms, location, rotation, scale, right? It really depends on what this control is meant to do. Here I want to have full control over it, so I'm going to set this initial value to a transform, and that's what's going to drive this controls value type here, okay? If you set that initial value to a vector, this control is going to be a position control. You get the idea. Now I find it easier to create all controls first and then worry about their transforms later on, else you kinda have to deal with relative transforms during the creation and it's a bit annoying. So in order to do that I'm going to create a local variable. By the way, this control rig editor shares much resemblance to blueprints, right? You have access to global and local variables, you can collapse graphs and so on. To avoid creating a spaghetti mess, just like in blueprints, you can also get an input pin via its own node. Super useful. Anyway, this local variable is going to be an array of rig elements and I'm going to set its length to whatever length that bones array is. Then update it to keep track of controls I created, like so. Once controls are created, I can set their transforms all in one go using the bones transform array and voila. Note that it's also important to return that execute context. Ok, let's add that function to the construction event and forward the list of bones. Here there are many solutions. You could use a rewrote and construct the list manually, like so. Or select all the desired bones, click and drag and create an item array. Cool, however it's apparently not working. Well, not quite right. I do have controls in the hierarchy, so it works, I just don't see them. So let's tweak those controls shape, maybe use a circle and scale it up a bit. Better. Also, depending on your bone orientation and all, you may need to tweak those shapes rotation like so. Now I want to point out that there are many ways to do things in control rig. For instance, instead of using an array of rig elements, you could use an array of names and find each bone. Same but different. You may also stumble on that kind of setup when dealing with the left and right side. A first for loop with two names, L for left side and R for right side. And for each side, loop through an array of bone names, concatenated to find the left and right bones, to create controls for and whatnot. Personally, I find it easier to deal with arrays of rig elements rather than names, but you do you, I guess. Anyway, controls are still not working. That's because here a control is a child of a bone, so moving it does not result in the bone moving, right? So I need to tell control rig to take each control's transform and apply it to the bone that control is parented to. And that happens during the forward solve. Here I created a construct spine function, so to be consistent I might as well create a forward spine function. Same thing, use an array of rig elements, this time called fk controls, and here it's as simple as it gets. Just forward those controls transform to the bones transform in global space and that's it. The transform of the first control in that array is applied to the first bone in that other array, and so on and so on. Cool, I still need to send that function the list of controls though. I could do that manually, right, but here I'm going to do things differently, so that setup doesn't break in case the controls names are later changed. I'm going to make this function output its local array, and store it in a global variable. I could also set a global variable directly within that function, but that'd be a bad design choice. That would constrain that function to create a spine and only that, right? Whereas by choosing to output that array, I can actually use this function to create any kind of fk controls, not just the spine. Arms, legs, whatever. Sweet, so I'm then going to pass that fk controls global array to that function, and actually I'm going to rename it to forward fk controls, because there's no reason for it to be specific to a spine, and tada, it's working. Except that, not really. 
Controls do have an effect, but behave on their own, like the hierarchy has no effect, right? And you'd expect controls to inherit movement from the controls below, but that's not what's happening. That's because the hierarchy is wrongfully built, and I kinda did that on purpose. First, because I wanted to demonstrate that the hierarchy is of great importance, and second, because I also wanted to show you you can reparent things using nodes. You can, for instance, use the switch parent node to say, hey, that element is now the child of that other element. Do that a bunch of times, and you can reconstruct a hierarchy. And now it behaves properly. Well, almost, but let's put on everything's alright for just one more minute. Last important step, Control Rig has the concept of a backward solver. Meaning the forward solver is used to forward transforms from controls to bones, right? Backward, you guessed it, is the other way around. From bones to controls. That's useful in case you want to edit an existing animation, because that animation would only contain a bunch of bones transform, right? So a control rig needs a method to first recreate the way controls are moving along with the bones during the animation. So you can then edit that animation if that makes sense. And here, once again, it's as simple as it gets. Just forward transforms from the bones to the controls in global space still, and that's it. You can then double check that controls are all moving properly by using a specific animation and turning on the backward solver here. Cool, that's one way of doing a super duper simple FK setup. However, notice this. I rotate this widget 45 degrees, and it rotates 90 degrees. Hmm. Now again, I want to remind you that I just recently been playing with Control Rig, so I might be missing a few things here and there, but as far as I know, that's not the right way to create a control hierarchy. Yet, it's what most YouTube tutorials demonstrate for some reason, even the documentation shows this approach, despite this note telling you it's best practice not to do this. Now I know Control Rig uses a quite uncommon stack approach to compute transforms. It's, as far as I know, designed to avoid cyclic dependencies, amongst other things, but it still doesn't entirely prevent this kind of behavior, and it just makes sense. See, this control is parented to this bone, so this control inherits from this bone's transform. So I'm rotating this control 45 degrees, which makes the bone rotate 45 degrees because of the applied transform, right? Thus, that control further inherits a 45 degree rotation from the bone it's parented to, and ends up being rotated 90 degrees. Now, typically in rigging, you have a hierarchy for deforming bones and one for controls. And your job as a rigger, amongst other things, is precisely to avoid that kind of issue. I promise you, animators don't like that sort of weird behavior. So, here's a better way of creating this simple FK setup. I first created a control for the root bone. It's the parent of the first control I create here, right? Then that control becomes the next control's parent, and so on and so on. This recreates controls with the same exact bone hierarchy, but quote-unquote separated, right? Thus solving the cyclic dependency issue. The final step would be to drag the control rig into the scene, and that automatically puts you in animation mode. You may then keyframe these controls however you like to create an animation, animation that you can then export to an animation asset. You can also edit an existing animation by using the sequencer on a skeletal mesh, right click on it, select bake to control rig, and select your control rig, and voila. That animation has been baked into a bunch of keyframes for your controls, keyframes you can then tweak to edit your animation and re-export it. Again, the basics are all very well explained in the documentation, so feel free to take a look at it if you want a more detailed step-by-step -step tutorial. Now that's the most basic FK setup, and if you're serious about creating good-looking animations, you know that you ain't going to go far with just such a basic FK setup for the entire rig. Inverse kinematic or IK is most often necessary, and for the spine especially, you really do need extra controls to handle hip swing and that kind of thing. Not to mention squash and stretch, limb twist, and so on. Rigging is definitely its own craft, not that easy to learn. But having a decent rig makes a huge difference when it comes to animation. On to a more advanced example then, this FKIK spine. Great for handling hip swing and just a nice setup to have overall, especially for cartoon characters. And buckle up because we're going from simple as can be to quite complex. Once again, this particular setup is entirely copied from this content example. So shout out to the engineer or engineers at Epic who made this. 
I merely made it, in my opinion, a bit more easier to digest and got rid of minor parts, but that's pretty much it. I take no credit for it. Alright, let's dive right into it. The one important thing to grasp here is that the IK and FK hierarchy have to be separated. The IK is parented to the root control, so it moves around with it and is used to generate a spline. The FK hierarchy is isolated and isn't parented to anything. FK nulls are then placed on that spline and FK controls, which are parented to nulls, further allow the user to trick the spline in a forward kinematic fashion. Let's start with a construct event. First, I simply create a null and a control for the root bone. Then I have that construct spine function, which takes a list of bones and a parent. In that function, here I first prepare local arrays and make sure they are correctly sized. For each spine bone, I create a null and a control attached to it. This control is going to be the next null's parent to create that kind of descending hierarchy. Null, control, null, control, and so on. I then simply snap those nulls and controls onto the bones. That creates those yellow circles, right? The FK controls. Now, this spine setup is meant to work with a bone chain of at least 4 bones, but you can have more. In fact, in the original example, it goes from the pelvis all the way up to the torso, so it has a total of 5 bones. But you see, the IK controls are positioned on the first two and last two bones. These two are to control the spine's endpoints, and these two the spine's curvature. And that's what these few nodes do, get the first two and last two bone transforms. Using those four points, I create a spline and get its rest length. Next, I create a null to be the parent of all IK controls. Why not? Here, I choose to parent it to the root control so the IK spine moves with it. Then, I prepare the IK controls array and create them. Those two at each end of the provided bone chain to control the spline's start and end points, and two more in between to control the spline's curvature. Finally, make those four IK controls be positioned on their four respective bones, and that's the construction event. On to the forward solve then. Well, first, forward the root controls transform to the root bone. Next, the spine, it's the headache inducing part, buckle up. I first send the list of controls, nulls, and bones. Then I can choose to limit stretch, and if so, how much it can stretch based on its initial length. The rest I'm going to explain in a second. So, first step is to create a spline from those IK controls. It's pretty straightforward, I just get their transforms and build an array of positions and then create a spline from that array. Then for each bone, I need to decide where they should end up on that spline using a 0 to 1 value. Meaning for 4 bones, that'd be 0, 1 third, 2 third, and 1. And in order to do that, I just leverage a for each ratio pin to build an array of 4 values, one for each bone. Then I remap that 0 to 1 range to another 0 to 1 range. Meaning, assuming this is my spline, going from 0 to 1, I can say, hey, actually that bone chain isn't going to be from top to bottom, but say from here to there. That's also where I decide if stretch should be limited. Knowing the spline's default length and its current stretch length, I can say, hey, that current 0 to 1 range should actually end up here if stretch is to be prevented. So that's what this function does. It takes the current spline length and a maximum allowed length, assuming this is true, a min and max range, a slide value to make the whole chain slide on the spline and have further control over it, and a reverse value that tells if the stretch limit should happen at the top, at the bottom, or a bit of both. And then obviously I send the list of 0 to 1 values to remap. Then here I first compute the spline's length ratio, can be below 1, then for each value, I'll compute a new remapped value, so prepare a local array. Next, loop through all values to update and store the result in that local array, which is then returned. This may look scary, but it's actually quite basic math. Similar in principle to the remap value range material function, just with a bit more controls, thus with a bit more adds and multiplies, but nothing to be scared of. Also, again, do yourself a favor and avoid making a spaghetti mess by getting those inputs via their own nodes, rather than dragging a dozen of warriors from two screens away. Anyway, now that those values are remapped, if limiting stretch, those remapped values need to be quote-unquote reprojected on the spline, because splines are weird. If I don't do this, this happens. Neat, we're getting close. Next, for each remapped value, I get the splines transform at that 0 to 1 position. 
And for each, I also interpolate the top and bottom IK controls rotation and scale. The interpolated rotation is used to drive the splines up vector. This is with and this is without. Notice how the roll is quote-unquote distributed along the spline. Same with scale, I don't actually care about the spline scale here. Finally, I replace the first and last rotations with the IK Control's original rotation. This is only relevant in case stretch is limited. Else this happens, I lose control over the bone's rotation at the start and end of the bone chain because, due to the stretch limitation, they can end up somewhere on the spline, if that makes sense. Last bit, and that's probably the most confusing part. Convert that array of spline transforms to local space to set those nerves transforms in local space. Then, that's confusing as well, combine the FK controls transforms with the transforms of the nerves they are parented to to create the final list of transforms in local space. And convert each to global space to finally apply transforms on the bone chain and voila. Now, I apologize, that bit here would be hard to explain in greater details without doing a complete course on coordinate system and space switching, so I'll remain somewhat vague here, but yeah, that's the end of it. Well, not quite. There's one last step, remember? The backwards solve. So first, the root control is simply snapped onto the root bone. Then comes more trouble. Given a chain of bones, we need to derive where those four IK controls lie in space to create a spline that results in the same bones transforms once the forward solver is applied. Does that make sense? It's some kind of reverse thinking, right? I haven't looked into it that much, to be honest, but again, it's just more math to create an array of four transforms, transforms used to set those IK controls transforms in global space. And here we have it, a quite usable IKFK spine setup. Again, I can stress this enough, this is not my own work. I merely recreated this existing setup from scratch and made it easier to digest, so this is not mine to sell. Thus, in case you're interested, files are available for free on my Patreon. Also, shout out to the technical writers and engineers at Epic for producing this great, great documentation and this cool content example. First, I construct a control for the root, Next, I construct FK controls for the arm, nothing fancy. There's the clavicle control, which is parented to that root control I just created. The upper arm, lower arm, and hand. I keep track of controls created in an array, set their transforms here, and return that array to store it in a global variable. Next, the IK controls for the arm. First, I create a null, parented to the FK clavicle. Then I create a control for the IK pole and hand, both parented to that null. The pole controls translation is set using this compute pole vector, which is a function that comes from the standard function library. That's, by the way, an awesome control rig feature. You can link functions in between control rigs, so this file is just a control rig like any other, right? It has a forward solver on all and contains functions you can use in any other control rig. That's neat. So this compute pole vector function does a bit of math to figure out where that pole vector should be located based on the triangle formed by that three bone chain you give it. There's no one right answer to this problem, by the way. The pole just has to lie somewhere on this plane, pretty much. So there's an offset value you can play with to set how distant that pole is from the elbow, which I personally clamp to prevent it from being too distant on occasions. Cool, that's the FK and IK controls. Finally, I create a float control to switch between FK and IK. I would use a boolean control, but for some reason it's not exposed here yet. So as far as I know, there's no way yet to create a boolean control using nodes, so float it is, no big deal. Then repeat that whole setup for the right arm. Next, the forward solver, so forward the root control transform, nothing fancy. Next, if in IK mode, apply the FK clavicle transform still, because the clavicle isn't part of the IK arm. Then make sure IK controls are visible. Apply the two bone IK on the upper and lower arm. Apply the IK hand control transform. Draw a line from elbow to pole with the same color, why not? 
And the important bit here, when in IK mode, FK controls follow along. Now it's worth noting that this IK-FK switch isn't perfect. There's a tiny jump, see? And I don't know why, to be honest, I looked and looked but couldn't find the reason. If you know why, please tell me in the comments below. It could be due to some rounding errors or floating point precision issue, I'm not sure. Anyway, due to this issue, I can't just snap FK controls to where bones are. Well, I could, but due to that imprecision, this IK pole would drift on and on upon switching back and forth between IK and FK. So instead, I recompute the same two bone IK using the bones transforms. It's pretty much the same, but that one updates bones you give it, and that one just spits out transforms bones would have if that IK was applied, if that makes sense. Thus, FK controls follow that IK chain along in a way that doesn't make this tiny imprecision cascade when switching between IK and FK on and on. It's a bit of a hack, and again, I'm still learning and not sure that's the best way to do things, but it's for now the only solution I found. Anyway, if in FK mode, well, apply FK controls transforms and figure out where the IK controls should be to create the same bone transforms if the IK was on, right? meaning compute where the pole vector should be and play the hand IK control. And that's pretty much it. If I keep all controls visible at all times, you can see this behavior. IK mode, the FK controls follow along. FK mode, the IK controls follow along. And I think currently that's the best way to go for a switchable IK FK setup. But again, I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments below if you have a better solution. Now keep in mind Control Rig is quite a beast of a system already and I'm only scratching the surface really. And it's also a two-part system. Meaning Control Rig can be used to create and edit animations offline, right? That's what I showcased so far. But it can also be used in-game to create procedural animations, corrective IKs and all kind of cool things. So let's take a brief look into this other side of Control Rig and see how to create an in-game leg IK system. One thing to keep in mind is that you're likely going to create one control rig to author and edit animations offline, a complex one, right, with lots of logic, and you're going to create a separate one, much simpler, one that likely doesn't need to use a backward solver at all, and say just handles leg IKs. That's exactly what this control rig does. Again, I did not make this, it's part of the starter content, so feel free to take a look at it yourself, and again shout out to whoever made this. I just merely tweaked a few things here and there and added debug lines. So it turns out this is dead simple, but I feel like there are a few things that need explaining. Let's have a quick look then. First, for each foot, trace for the ground and get how much that foot has to be shifted in Z based on that trace. For both feet, interpolate that Z offset over time to smooth out the IK behavior a bit. Next, use the minimum of those two offsets for the pelvis offset to prevent overextension. Apply offsets to the feet and pelvis in an additive fashion and apply the full body IK with the pelvis locked in place so the full body IK is only a partial body solver. And that's pretty much it. Now I admit that setup kind of fried my brain for a while. Because if you think about it, here we trace for the ground. So assuming our character is running and its feet are placed like so, if we were to trace from that foot to the ground and shift that foot by however distant it is to it, that foot would be snapped onto the ground at all times, right? And I remember I used to build IK solutions with such a naive way of thinking back in the days and I had to do all kind of tricks to avoid this. So how does this setup work? Because clearly it doesn't do anything special to prevent this. Well, it doesn't trace from the foot to the ground, that's the key thing. It only cares about the foot's X and Y position and uses the root bone's Z position, slightly offset upward and downward, to create a line trace at the ground level. Thus, it doesn't care about where the foot is in Z, it only outputs how much the actual ground is above or below the base of our character, its root bone. So even if that foot is airborne, it's offset in Z by that distance and same for that other foot. And then the pelvis is shifted by the smallest of the two offsets to allow that leg to reach its target. One other detail to keep in mind is that the sphere trace is in global space, or rig space. This hit location is not a world position. So if I move around and watch the offset the sphere trace outputs, if the ground is flat, it's always around negative 2 cm, despite the ground altitude, okay? 
Why negative 2 cm? Well, the character movement component has some kind of safety margin built in that usually results in a 2 cm offset from the actual ground. So the capsule is vertically offset by that amount, hence why the feet are moved downward by that same amount to make contact with the ground. One other important thing to note is that the full body IK needs effectors to work with. It needs targets to reach for the feet, right? And it obviously can be the foot bones. So Unreal Engine Skeleton has IK bones that move around with the foot bones in most animations. Those are the ones that are moved around in control rig and used as effectors. If you have a rig that doesn't have such IK bones, or they are not moving along with the foot bones for some reason, there are workarounds. You can create a control for each foot, apply the foot bone motion to each control, then move those controls around and use them as effectors. And that pretty much does the same thing. Finally, having set up this control rig, all you get to do is go to your animation blueprint, drop a control rig node where you want to apply this logic, select the control rig and maybe expose that do IK boolean thingy, which should be false if in air, and ta-da! That's it, I hope this video helped you in some way in your control rig journey. If you liked the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. Also consider joining my Patreon to get access to all kinds of cool UE projects and support me as well. I thank you for watching, I thank you for your support, I'll see you in the next video, take care of yourself, bye bye!